Hey, Steve, welcome to the show. Is where you getting started? Tell us about yourself. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Steve Boardman. Uh, I run a technology consulting practice here in Phoenix. Um, I have two kids. Uh, my daughter's birthday is tomorrow. Um, I have a wonderful wife who is an attorney and a better athlete than I am. Um, so <laughs> does she prove it every day? Or what? She does, but from, from the wife part or the attorney part, I don't know. Oh, the so, athlete part. <laughs> yeah. It's it's funny nowadays, now that we've all been home, um, it's, it's nice to see that there's other people in her crosshairs and not myself. I'll tell I'll yeah. say. <laughs> That's a, that's a dangerous combination, athlete and attorney. Yeah. Yeah. And when she was a pregnant mother, you had the, you had the hat trick. The trifecta. Get out of her way. So that, that's my life in a nutshell. I mean, I'm a pretty competitive guy, but I think um, when it, when you really boil it all down, I, I really enjoy people. I heard a, a quote one time that said about Arnold Palmer, people are his oxygen. And I feel the same way is true for me. Um, I enjoy you know, being a positive impact in people's lives. Um, obviously, marrying my wife was the best decision I've ever made, and I have two wonderful children. Um, but I, I really enjoy people, and I really help people develop and uh, trusting me with, with their career. And a lot of times, it's when they're getting their career started. Cool. And how'd you get into kind of like the sales side? Would you call it sales or would you call Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a, a technology staffing company. Um, I got into it because I had started out in college, uh, I worked for a private jet startup and a friend of mine, uh, which was in, in 97 or excuse me, 2007, 2008, which is when the markets were collapsing. And, yeah. um, we found that, uh, we found that people would fly private, although not buy a jet, but they would certainly charter one. Right. Yeah. So we found a little niche. And I think the only difference between that business and this business still a brokerage is that uh, just because someone flew in October or November doesn't necessarily mean they would fly in, in December. Right. They could be their home for the holidays. And in and, and this business, you know, we're putting people to work on contracts. And I had a friend of mine uh, from Seton Hall uh, that said, hey, why don't you check out this company, Edgerock? And um, it's a different business model and there's more of a recurring revenue stream. And um, that was 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. And, and here we are. Yeah, <clears throat> that's it's kind of a hard business because you're like matchmaking, right? Yeah. I did it in college with some friends trying to set our friends up. And now here I am setting up customers with, with top talent and it's hard, but I, I take a lot of pride and I've learned from some really good people. I, I remember my interview at Edrock, uh, Tim Gibbons, who's one of the founders here. I asked him what his secret sauce was and he said, it's pretty simple. You, you find good people and you train them really well. And, uh, I think the same is true with identifying top talent and you understand where the talent is and you, you, you make sure that they partner with you and you bring them to market. And, and that's what we've done for 10 years here. Edge Rocks were after 15. I've been doing it for 10. And how'd you get this mindset? Was it in college? Was it, uh, you know, before then? As far as the leadership of people or, or how to, what do you mean? By how, how to put people together and develop it because it can be frustrating, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm very thankful for my upbringing. I have two wonderful parents. Um, my dad traveled the world when I was a kid, my mom raised us and I was the oldest of four and, and four of us inside of three and a half years with no twins and dad's on the road a lot. You, I mean, I remember some stories growing up where you had to keep everyone together. Cause it was almost, you had to keep everyone alive because mom can't look at four people at one time. Yeah. And, uh, I, I just think that mindset of, of we had it called team boardman growing up. We're always together and that's never left me. Um, I had a genuine care for my siblings, my parents. And uh, I think working with people is how I'm able to continue to do that. Yeah. Because that, that oldest in the birth order, were they tight in age? Yeah. So I was born in uh, September or excuse me, January of 87. My sister is, June of 88, my brother's September of, of 89 and my brother's October of 90. So it's back that's pretty, that's as tight as it gets. <laughs> so I remember having to be a, you know, when my dad was on the road, I had to be quote unquote, the, you know, the man of the house. And although it's my mom's house, I don't want to be, I don't want that to be mistaken, but um, no, there was, there was a lot of, 
you know, learning things very early as far as the realities of life that I've, I've, I experienced and I, I think, I think just comes with the territory of being the oldest. Cool. And what was the motivation to get into leadership versus just staying as in sales? Ah, uh, I've worked, for, I've worked for some good leaders. I've had some great coaches and I think the, the best memories I have are of some of the things that I've learned from the people I've learned it from. Yeah. And I think naturally people trust me and I think I'm, they see that I can be hard on them, but I can get the best out of them. Not for my benefit, but for theirs. Uh, and uh, that drew me to it and being able to, I would say, know that I can protect my, cr my crew and help them and help them develop. And then if it works out great, if not, if I made them a better human being, that's all right too. So, oh. and how do you stay away from kind of like the, the opposite of that, which is kind of the natural yell at them, get them <laughs> because well, it, it's a high pressure job, right? It is. It is. I mean, I, I remember this story growing up of, and I'm sure my grandparents will watch this, but that's okay. I remember when we had a bad dream growing up, we could, we could walk over to my parents' bed and my mother would say, put, a, put down a blanket and lay down right beside us. It's okay. You're safe. Yeah. And I know um, I, I, I felt in certain situations in business that I didn't really, I don't want to say I wasn't safe, but I knew what it felt. Um, I run an office here that's 2,500 miles from headquarters. And I wanted people to experience that security blanket, so to speak, that they can trust me and that, um, that, that I'm here to, I'm here to protect them and I'm here to show them how it's supposed to be done for really no return at all. It's, it's, it's just who I am. I'm, I'm here to make a positive impact on people. Yeah. And what do you expect in return? Their very best, their, um, their ability to listen and try to put into, put into action what, what I teach them. Um, I, I think I would say one of my biggest strengths and greatest faults is the same is that when I, when someone loses, when I lose trust with someone, it's pretty much over. And I do not want to be more vested in your success than yourself. You better own it. And, um, that's what I want in return. I remember coaching a baseball team and, uh, there was a, there was a couple of kids that certainly weren't the best athletes, but when you got them to hit a double, actually the kid was from Holliston, the kid that I'm thinking about, um, he hit a double in a, in a pressure clutch situation. Um, that to me is, is what I expect. I expect your best, but I want to sit back and watch you, watch you flourish as well. Yeah. And, and loyalty is that big yeah. on your list? It is, it is, but I understand we're also in business, right? And yeah. um, I expect people's, I expect people's loyalty, but I, I also expect that they're going to do what's in the best interest of themselves. And sometimes that's with us and sometimes it's not. And, and that's okay. Yeah. Because that space can be very transient, can't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But I, we always talk about if you can find one good person a year to add to your team, one pillar, yeah. to, you know, one more uh, arrow in your quiver, so to speak, as my boss, Matt Murray says, you're doing okay. And uh, that's what we strive for. And, and what do you look for in those people since you don't know them, you know, you're interviewing them. Yeah. What do you look for? I think I just look for people that are really genuine. That, that I think that's a good start. Um, it, I, I, I'm big on their references, what their references say. Yeah. Um, I, I've had the wool pulled over my eyes before, and I'm sure I will again. I've made a million mistakes that I'm sure a lot of people watching this that say, well, yeah, he missed there too. But um, I really, honestly, I look for people's ability to be genuine, their ability to be transparent, their ability to honestly self-reflect and say, here's what I bring to the table. Here's where I lack. And I try to think, okay, where can we have this piece fit our puzzle? Yeah. And let's talk about those mistakes because a lot of people make them. Was it sure. when you just went with your gut feeling? Was it that, you know, it was a broken toy that you thought you could fix? Yeah, there's yes and yes. Um, I, I, when I first came into leadership, I thought you instantly got respected. I just thought that's what it was. Man, was I wrong. 
<laughs> it's kind of just the opposite. <laughs> it is. But I will say this is we had a, uh, an executive coach when, when myself and a couple of others got promoted into leadership and we had all done well from a, um, a revenue perspective, rev- revenue generation perspective. Yeah. And the thing that changed for me was I thought to myself, oh my God, here I am responsible for leading people. I don't, I got to bet my mortgage on, on, on these people. And we have a kid on the way, right? We just bought a house. Holy crap. And what, what dawned on me in that, in that session was when the woman said to, to us, you've had to influence people to influence your wallet from a client perspective, you should be able to apply that same mentality to your employees. And if, if you're able to get, buy-in from your clients you should be able to do the same if you do it right so when i look at our employees here uh, i look at as a family and uh i would say understanding that i can understand where they're looking to go help them grow themselves just like our clients do i'm going to be able to reap the financial return that i need to we'll say keep our house afloat so to speak and how was that first year did you have the the desire to pounce on the deals or hijack them or second guess each decision. All of the above. And still, still to this day, it's a, it's a big temptation, right? Um, I can think of a story just with a newer rep that I have here um, six months ago, or excuse me, three months ago. um, There was a deal that had was a total dead end and I needed to let him fall flat on his face so he could learn that, okay, we're chasing a bad deal. And, you know, I, I heard one time that a lot of times speed bumps and roadblocks, you're either able to get over them and they're the reason why you can get a deal done, or you can also let it be the reason why you can't get a deal done. And I think over time, people need to understand that and say, okay, is this a deal breaker? Is, is this a good, a good choice, a good deal? Or do I need to walk away from it and spend my time elsewhere? And, and, and that's it. Can you look for that? in recruitment because i always had this analogy that there's certain people that have to touch the stove mm-hmm. meaning that they see the flame you tell them it's hot you tell them not to touch it but the curious there's something in there that that yeah. says i i have to touch it <laughs> and i'm sure you as a father of <laughs> might have experienced that We've only had one emergency room trip in this entire quarantine. So I think we're doing okay. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have that mastered. I really don't as far as yeah. who, who's going to have that, who's not, I need to see it in action. Um, but have the discipline. I'm a talker at, at heart. And for me, learning how to listen um, was very difficult. And I, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm as good of a listener out there as there is because I genuinely care in people. And so to answer your question, how do I identify that early? I certainly don't have a a silver bullet. I really don't. Right. Because I mean, sales kinds of attracts, not a daredevil, but a risk taker. Certainly. Right. Especially in your space, I would think it's much more of a risk taker. Yeah. You know, higher upside, you know, downside isn't, is probably lower than most places. Mm -hmm. Right. But upside's yeah. higher. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But to your point though, and I think of it, I'm, I'm a big golfer and um, it's, it's your ability to want to bet on yourself. Right. Yeah. And, and I find very quickly when I interview people, who's looking for a higher salary versus who's looking for the bigger upside. And when I hear that, that someone's more focused on the upside and by the way, a lot of general managers and team team owners have had, a lot of intense disagreements when the word upside comes into play in professional sports. But I think generally speaking with people that I'm interviewing, if they're willing to bet on themselves, there's someone that I want on my team. And how about as far as looking for, you know, people call it coaching people. I I just look for openness, the ability to discuss a topic without being, you know, putting the helmet on and getting defensive. Sure. You know, sure. Let's talk about a deal. What do you think is going to happen? Let's yeah. play it out two or three months from now or whatever the life cycle is. What do you think is going to happen next? Right. Right. Because I think in order to, to be successful, at least in our business, you have to, I, I think Jeb Blount called it, called it murder boarding, right? What could possibly go wrong in this deal? 
right? And, and we need to be honest with each other and say, where could this thing fall apart? But on the contrary, when you win one, I think it's equally as important to diagnose why you want it and where you want it, yes. because that's what you're trying to replicate. Right. And, and too often in sales, the, the rep is thinking one step ahead and has a lot of blind spots because you naturally don't, you go crazy if you look at a model. Yeah. Yeah, but, I agree with that. But as a leader, you can, you kind of, you know, oh, they're not calling you back. Well, yeah, they might be on vacation. <laughs> Right? <laughs> or they if might have went with someone time, else. Your call, right? If you're worth their time, they're going to take your call. And yeah. it's, I, I've, I've had reps and, and I do it myself. I, and I, I've learned so much from my children. Um, by the way, I think every, everyone in sales should try this technique. Kids? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but literally when you, when you ask someone a question, simple questions should get simple answers, right? I mean, is she pregnant or not? There's not a maybe, it is yes or no. And I think when you ask a basic question and get a long answer, someone doesn't know. And the word should, I think needs to be removed from the dictionary and I'll say why. My wife told me one, asked me one day if the gate was up with the kids. And I said, yeah, it should be. And she said, well, you don't know, right? And so I think it's important. And again, I go back to my children that when, you, when you're asking someone a question, you gotta wait three seconds for their answer. and again, as a talker, it's very difficult because I want to share my feelings and, and my thoughts. But when you're with kids, let them articulate who they are and what they want. And it's the same thing is true in sales. And I think, you know, you're going to get a lot more insights if you shut up and let someone finish than if you try to butt in and impose what your own belief is. And how do you develop the people? Time, trust, um, one-on-ones for me are very important. Um, I, I think about it, it all starts with a good start for me. Everyone that starts here and I, I might've missed one. So if someone, I have a caveat out there. Uh, I, I write everyone a letter when they start here and say why, you know, why I'm excited to have them on my team. And I write that purely from the heart as what I think they bring to the table and where they fit. And that's to me, how do I develop the people? That's where it starts. And it's really taking the time to sit back and observe what do they do well? Where do I think they can improve? And where do I choose to impose my will? And I would say you generally have to have a, a coach them up mentality. And I think you only need to direct people in one of two situations and one of two situations only when there's an emergency and two, when they have no idea what the hell they're doing. And other than that, outside of those two situations, you need to find an opportunity to coach someone up and help them build their skills because that's what's going to really, as a leader, be enjoyable to watch once they figure it out. And what's your flow with the one-on-one? -on -one? Every week. Have, not, not the, oh. how do you start it off? What are you looking for? Yeah. I mean, I just had one this morning with, uh, with Dan and First thing we talk about is we bond. We bonded over, you know, what he's a football fan. We were talking about football this weekend. Um, but then, I, you know, I asked, I asked, what's the best thing that happened to you last week? And we look at what deals do we have that are up there, right? What do we need to help move through the pipeline? Um, what could be potentially stalling, right? And then ultimately talking about certain situations. It's, it's hard because we're not in the office now. Yeah. But... <clears throat> And a little bit about this conversation. What do you think you did well? What do you think you need improvement on? And I have them explain to me what they believe they need help with, not me tell them. Yeah. I think it's it's ninety percent really listening to what their side of the story is and, and coaching accordingly. So again, to answer your question, it's it's uh, it starts revenue, you know, pipeline, and then talk to me about what calls you have coming up. I, I look at call scheduling like a pipeline, yeah. right? because that's where your business is going to be derived from. So that's how my one-on-ones typically go, but it's very, very personal, very, very coaching. And I, I don't use that term loosely. It's more so understanding where to push than directing. And I've interviewed probably 150 top reps. And I always ask, you know, what were some of the epiphanies that you had throughout your career? Mm -hmm. And they're usually small ones that somebody else pointed out. Mm -hmm. Like they talk too much, they talk too fast. Um, you know, they they showed up late. 
it was like little nits. Yeah. And at first they reacted defensively, even hurt. Okay. But then they realized they changed it because it was easy to change. Right. But they never would have saw it themselves. Have you ever been able to face somebody with something like that? Oh man, that's a good one. The answer is yes. I'm trying to think of a good situation. Um, they're not easy. Oh, they're not. But I, because we, when you look at, I, I did it once, and I kind, of, I, I, I didn't do it um, well. I just told the guy, I just told man, you just talk way too much. <laughs> Yeah. But you gotta have them come with motivation for it to carry the weight for you, right? Well, you know, I I lost his attention for a couple of days, but then he thanked me. He goes, you yeah. know, my wife said the same thing when I told her the story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can think of some situations where, and I think a lot of it is just kind of getting people back on the straight and narrow, right? Yeah. I mean, I think this business, there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of fires that it, it's very react. It can be very a reaction based business. It can be if you let it. And before you know it, you could be in over your head. And I've, I've had one on ones with people that I knew they were, but I needed them to come to me and tell me that they were over their head. And they did. And it's, it's literally therapy, right? And it, it feels just as good, I think, to help someone come out of that than it is, um, than it is for them. I really do. I think yeah. it's very, very two sided. And your team recommended you for the podcast. What makes, what do you think was behind that? Keep you busy for a half hour? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, no, I, I th- in, in, as my honest answer, I think it's because they knew I wouldn't do it for myself. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't put myself out there like this. I'm not someone that wants all the accolades. I really don't. I just really enjoy helping people. So. And I think what they wanted was to, um, was to return the favor. And I heard one time that your people are your helium. They'll get you to where you want to go. And I, I think about that a lot. And without even realizing it, here's what they did. And where this goes, I don't know. I'm, I'm very happy here, but I'm just more so humbled. I, I'm not one for the spotlight. I'm really not. I really like watching other people shine. But I think they did it because they wanted to return the favor and do to me what I've been helping with them with the last, you know, eight, 10 years, whatever it may be. Yeah. And what's kept you at the same place? I mean, that's a long tenure. Yeah. I love this company. Um, I, I love this company. I love the people I work with. I love the people that I work for, although I don't see it as working for people that we work together. Um, this company has been through uh, three acquisitions and I don't know how else to say it, but I, I think of the, the people that I work with, the people that I help develop and the people that I work for, know my wife, know my kids, ask about them all the time. It is very much in my blood and that's why I'm here. I, I, it's because of the people. It's, I trust them. I trust them with my career and I trust them with my family and I, I'm, I don't have any desire to go anywhere else. Yeah. And- when you talk to other leaders, do you see any pattern of either what they're doing right or what they're doing wrong? Yeah, I think it probably screams at the last six or seven months, right? You know, how have you done? And I, I, if I think if you really boil it down to a couple of things, it's how much do you trust your people? How much do you care about their, your people? And how much do you communicate with your people? which now is easier than it's ever been from, again, greetings from my office, which is used to be a spare bedroom, but it's, you have to continually communicate over communicate, understand the, the, the roadblocks that they have, uh, whether it be personal or professional, but ultimately understand that you're here to help them get there to where they want to go. But trust has got to be the, the, the common denominator. And I think if you do those three or four things, well, that that's what I know is from my colleagues and friends in the industry and just in, in, in leadership combined, I think that's going to be your ticket to success. And you've used the word trust a lot. What does that mean to you? Everything, everything. But, but, but how do you, what exactly, how would you describe it? Uh, I, 
I would say it's, it's someone having your back. I think it's, I, I think, I think it's being in the, in the right place at the right time with the right people and knowing that when they're not looking, they know that you're, you're still going. And I would say vice versa. I, I was thinking about a, a, a situation we had last week. I was talking to one of my colleagues this morning about it. And, you know, she said, it's, it's great to work with great people that you're on the same page with. And when you trust people um, work and you're working together, I think that's what you need. So what does it mean? It, well, it's, it's hard to put into words. Is it like they understand you and you understand them? Or is it when they say it's a seven, you know what a seven means versus an eight or a six? Uh, I, I think that's honestly going to depend from person to person sometimes, right? <laughs> I think it is. I, I think it's a combination, though, of, of, of shared vision, shared goal, and understanding that you can work in conjunction with the other people to help you get there. I really do. Yeah. And have, I'm sure you've had it where that didn't exist with somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it didn't work out well. But. <laughs> is there a way to repair that or is it just, it's not a match? I, I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is this, I'll, I'm willing to give people second chances. Um, but at the same time, you're always going to have that scarlet letter cast from me that I'm always going to have a doubt regardless as to where things go. But I, th I think I'm willing to get, give people a second chance, but that's it. After yeah. that, it's not going to work. And what was that game playing, lying, backstabbing or selfishness that gave you that feeling? Which all comes in business, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they all kind of happen. Um, I, I would say probably someone that, I don't want to say bring you down. That's not a good way to put it. But I think when you tell me you're doing something and I know you're not. Yeah, lying. Yeah, I think it's it's mostly just lying. When, when I was a kid, that was my mother's biggest thing is don't lie to me. And I can take the truth. I just need to know it. And my mom always told me a story of her father walked in the house and he asked her a question and he said, tell me the truth. And she said to my grandfather, can you handle the truth? And he walked back downstairs. He didn't want to hear the answer. So that's sort of the environment that I grew up in. I can take the truth. I just need to know it, but don't BS me. Don't, don't try to pull one over me. It's not going to work. Because in a lot of cases there's, People want the lie because they don't want to face the truth. Right. But I think at some point you're going to have to face it anyway. Right. Yeah. You're only delaying the inevitable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Say I blew it. I messed up or I was yeah. ticked off and I left, you know, two hours early. Like I can live with that. I've been yeah. there, yeah. you know, I, I've had one-on-ones with people over a, over something cold late in the afternoon just to get out and, Say, I get it. I've been there. I've lived it. There's nothing that you can tell me that I'm going to be disappointed in you with unless I find out you lied to me. Yeah. So that's, that to me is where it is. Cool. Hey, I really appreciate your time today, Steve. Where can people go to follow you? So go to my LinkedIn. Um, it's, it's LinkedIn. I think it's S Boardman one. Uh, and I, I, what I can do is I can, I can post this after give me a call. My phone number's right there. My email's right there. And, I guess if you really wanted to contact me, I'd be on the first tee box every Sunday, Saturday morning uh, at the golf course down, down here. So that's, uh, that's how you get in touch with me.